Before I begin this review for the sixth episode of Star Trek Picard, The Impossible Box, I want to recommend a YouTube channel to you, Major Grin. He's doing these fantastic edits where he takes clips of episodes of the other Trek shows and compares them to the current Trek shows in terms of philosophy, morality, and continuity. And there's an especially good video he did where he compares how TNG dealt with the rights of synthetic life forms versus how Star Trek Picard is currently dealing with them. Well worth checking out. You can see that the writers of modern Trek know very little about the franchise and the spirit of what the Federation stood for. Anyway, the impossible box finally unites Picard and Soji after six episodes, but it only happens very briefly at the end of the episode. So, frustratingly, there's no significant progress in the overall story arc. Not that we're really caring at this point, are we? I mean, there's so many theories floating around about how this story is going to conclude, and none of them really sound all that interesting. Is Soji a future Borg queen, perhaps? Is that why they call her the Destroyer? Is Picard going to once again become Locutus? Are the Borg and the Jad Vash going to team up to attack the Federation? I don't know. There's literally nothing they can do at this point that's going to salvage this train wreck of a season. Anyway, the crew of whatever the hell this ship is called are on the way to the Romulan-controlled Borg cube, and Jurati has to explain how and why Maddox died in the previous episode. Just to remind you, she killed him, rather brutally. She lies to him. She tells Picard that his death was as a result of internal bleeding, and Picard believes her because he's now completely clueless and too trusting. He's very naive and just a bit dumb in this series. In the previous episode, he's trying to talk Seven of Nine out of killing Bejazel, the woman who looks a little bit like Deanna Troy, whose name sounds like Vejazel, right? <laughs> And then later, she asks him to beam her back down to Free Cloud, and she asks if she can take some phasers. And he's like, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> and then she goes down, and unsurprisingly, what do you know, she kills Vijazel, Vijazel, whatever. So Picard just believes Jurati in this instance, and she's now wrestling with her conscience because in edgy, dark, dystopian Trek, Everyone has a dark secret. Everyone's bitter and tortured and hits the booze on more than one occasion. Seven of Nine, who on Voyager couldn't handle her booze if it was to save her life, is now just knocking back the bourbon straight up. Raffi has to be the most pissed and high starship pilot in history. I wouldn't trust her behind the wheel of my starship. She hits the herb and the bottle on more than one occasion. Rios takes the occasional swig from his hip flask, which he also offers to Jurati in this episode, who tells us how she's feeling. She feels hollow, hopeless, lonely, afraid. Yeah, you see, this is how you can tell the poor quality of the writing. You see, in a time of feels over reels and emotional incontinence, writers seem to think characters being emotional and talking about how they feel is deep and layered characterization. In truth, characters crying and being angry, argumentative, depressed, and constantly complaining well, and then they're talking about how they feel, this tells us nothing about them, other than the fact that it makes them sound extremely narcissistic and they're constantly enraptured in their own neuroticism, ego, and personal pain. They're very self-absorbed. Now, for a generation of spoiled liberal millennials who have been emotionally coddled, this might seem like very relatable material. But in well-written television shows, a character's depth believability, relatability, and likability is demonstrated not just based on what they say, but what they do and how they react to and overcome the challenges they face in their lives. It also helps if they have believable motivations for their actions and if we have some understanding of their backstory. I still don't really know anything about Jurati. But instead, there's a focus on emotional diarrhea, crying and being melancholy, depressed and tortured, rather than fleshing out the details of the life of the character. Just as an aside, I've mentioned before that this over-focusing on emotionality is one of the reasons I believe science fiction has been so dumbed down in recent years. The focus has shifted from the intellectual to the emotional. Now, a hero is someone who feels fear but isn't bound or enslaved by it. True strength and bravery is overcoming external real-world challenges regardless of how they make a character feel. That's how they develop and grow and discover inner courage. But now the emphasis seems to be on dwelling on the emotional, as if that's just as important as whatever actual real-world challenge the character must overcome. But anyway, I'm digressing here. 
After a couple of episodes together on the ship, suddenly Gerati and Rios are intimate, and it just doesn't feel earned because it feels like they haven't gotten to know each other yet. But they're being written in a way like their growing romance is already fairly well advanced and developed. So that makes their kiss seem about as earned and left to field as Rey and Kylo's kiss at the end of Rise of Skywalker. I could also say the same thing about Narek and Soji. Now, even the audience doesn't really know any of these characters yet, and we don't know what they're all about, so everything that they're doing on screen just seems a bit random and arbitrary. Also, it seems all of the problems that the Federation had eliminated in Roddenberry's future, they've all returned, I suppose. Drug abuse, bigotry, violence, hopelessness, greed, intolerance. All we're seeing in this show is the ugliest aspects of humanity and humanoid life. So Picard has a moment with Girati in the mess hall area where he talks about the Borg and how they don't change, how they metastasize, which I think was a very good description. And I know some people are being a bit nitpicky and saying that, well, the Borg do change. Adaptation is their nature, after all. But I liked this speech. This was actually my favorite part of the episode because he's basically referring to their relentless nature to conquer and consume all life. And I think that was good. Anyway, I have no idea what this Lord of the Rings type character is doing on the show. Aside from being yet another alien with a very regional Earth sounding accent, this time Australian, I think. He doesn't do anything interesting. He has nothing to offer and seems cliched, out of place, and generally a bit simple. Moreover, he is ultimately just a guy with a sword. I don't care how much training he has or how skilled he is with a blade. Even the frickin' Klingons with their bathlets knew when to use disruptors in Star Trek. How am I supposed to take this guy seriously as an effective mercenary and warrior when he's running around with a sword when we know that this is a world of phasers and rifles? Anyway, there's another dour Game of Thrones type villain scene between Swindon Spock and his incesty sister. I still can't remember her name. The writing is so bad that even the most hackneyed James Bond villain has more depth and relatability than these two characters. We're six episodes in. And still these two characters have just one mode of speaking to each other. Snark, sarcasm, derision, threats, and all-round nastiness and spite. We get it. They're the bad guys because they speak with hostility and with menacing tones of voice to each other all the time. This is so lazy, unoriginal, and one-dimensional writing. So anyway, they arrive at the Borg Cube and Picard beams over and he has some flashbacks to past experiences with the Borg, and they use some footage from Star Trek First Contact, which works reasonably well. You can see how tortured Picard is, and as usual, Stewart does a very good job with this. He meets Hugh, and they embrace, overjoyed to see each other. Now, unless they've met in the intervening years, this hug seemed a bit odd. It wasn't bad or anything, but it wasn't like these guys were close buddies on TNG or something. Anyway, Soji starts questioning her past and begins scanning her personal belongings and finds that, like her, they were all created around the same time, 37 months ago. Narek tries to help her interpret a recurring dream that she's been having. It's a dream of herself as a child. And as she begins to activate, he tries to kill her. But then her super strength kicks in and she's able to break through the floor of the room and escape. And then Hugh and Picard find her. Elnor comes over to the cube to protect Picard and some Romulan guards are on their way, and Hugh helps Picard and Soji escape through this spatial trajector. It's basically a portal, and when you walk through it, it lets you transport anywhere in the galaxy. It has a range of 40,000 light years. Wow, now with that kind of teleportation range, who needs spaceships, right? Who needs warp drive? The Sicarians appeared in the Voyager episode Prime Factors. That's where we first heard about the spatial trajector. Now, Surely, if the Borg acquired such technology from them, they wouldn't use it for emergency purposes. They'd use this to replace their transwarp drive technology completely and just take over the galaxy. They could presumably expand this technology to send fleets of vessels to Earth in a matter of minutes or transport thousands of drones to every city on Earth. Now, there was an episode of Deep Space Nine. It was from the fourth season and it was called To the Death, where Cisco and the crew of the Defiant worked alongside some Jem'Hadar to stop some renegade Jem'Hadar soldiers from repairing an Iconian gateway, which worked in a very similar manner to this Sicarian spatial trajector. Wayun tells Sisko that if the renegade Jem'Hadar repair the gateway, 
they could transport anywhere in the galaxy. The Dominion believed that if these renegades could convince the rest of the Jemadar to also revolt, that they could take over the whole Dominion within the space of a year. Sisko remarked how this would make them become virtually invincible. So as you can see, this kind of technology has some pretty serious applications. And yet, it's just passed off in this episode as nothing more than a kind of long-range teleportation device to be used in emergency situations only. But as usual, this is an episode of Star Trek Picard, so there's not an awful lot of deep thought or logical consideration given to the very obvious potential for such technology. Star Trek fans are very clever, and they're going to think about these things. If the Borg have this Sicarian technology, it simply doesn't make any sense for them to not use it as a primary weapon against every species they want to assimilate in the galaxy. So it seems like in this instance, they just used it for our heroes as a kind of deus ex machina. With only four episodes left in this season, part of me wants to stop watching until the last four episodes air and then just watch them all together because I'm kind of getting sick of this drip-fed, serialized narrative. What we're getting with Star Trek Picard is this underwhelming story, and as I've said before, it could have been done over four or five episodes but it's just been stretched too far over 10. Those are my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll catch you next time. Computer, establish a secure comlink to Captain Sulu of the Starship Excelsior. Hello, Admiral Picard. This is Captain Sulu, USS Excelsior. We stand ready to assist you. Captain, I'd love your thoughts on this new series of mine. We've got some strong female characters who love to continuously put me in my place. Tech science that's more like magic, disturbing and graphic violence, a bleak and dystopian world of cynical characters, unnecessary swearing, a boring plot that's going nowhere, and a federation that has betrayed everything it once stood for. The federation does not get to decide if a species lives or dies. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. Oh my. Do we destroy this, sir? Are you kidding? Target that series and fire.